one standards um, are going to be very low. They're going to be very difficult in beyond the limit of technology even for, for nitrogen. The, if you look at these numbers and remember them for a little bit later, one thing you notice on the, on the rivers and streams, the cold and warm limits are less than a tenth of a microgram per liter. These are very difficult for municipalities. Uh, nitrogen in the, in the rivers and streams, you're less than two, my, uh, two milligrams per liter. Extremely low levels beyond the limit of technology. You know, you're in the point of, of reverse osmosis, which is wonderful if you live near the ocean and you have somewhere that you can dispose of your brine. I don't think we're going to be building a huge pipeline to the ocean. Um, chlorophyll is something that's not been done in the past. It's looking at the the level of algae in the stream. The lakes and reservoirs, if you have a drinking water reservoir, are going to have a very low number of five. You know, all of these numbers are still proposed. They're, these could change. Things are changing very rapidly. But what's proposed at this point for rivers and streams is 150. And th this kind of gives you a view. The top three rivers are below the 150. The others are various levels above that. Kind of give you an idea of what that would mean and what it would look like in the stream. Now, can we do these numbers? <coughs> That's another question. You know, they, they're very low. They were set by looking at reference areas. If you have all these reference areas and you allow a certain amount of, of reduction in the amount of macroinvertebrates uh, to live in that area, what level of nitrogen and phosphorus would that correlate to? It, is that doable? Probably not. There's a lot, of, a lot of problems with getting down to these ultra low levels, a lot of huge amounts of expense for municipalities. Data collection is going to be needed to determine if these numbers are even valid. It, the <coughs> municipalities are finding that there's a lot of other sources. There's a lot of non-point sources out there. So you know, that type of data needs to be collected to determine what needs to be done where. And then, so Colorado determined that there was, it was time to do something a little different than the norm. The reg, reg 31 is the normal process. It's going to take TMDLs and probably most every segment <coughs> to determine what the appropriate standards are. And that TMDL process is very expensive. It can be millions of dollars and end up with numbers for municipalities that potentially will be zero because a TMDL must have reasonable assurance that those numbers are going to be met. And a lot of non-point sources are BMPs and you cannot guarantee those are going to meet numbers. So that requirement goes back to the municipalities. So this new approach was to look at <coughs> now what else could be done and what, it, what could be done in short term to have measurable improvements in the river to gather information from the other sources and keep the cost down in a, in a range that could be controlled a little bit. And they came up with a control rate concept which would allow a technology-based standard which would be BNR for existing facilities, which biological nutrient removal is a, a first-level nutrient <coughs> removal that is less expensive for municipalities, and then if it's a new facility, it would have to be enhanced BNR, which is beginning to add chemicals, and, and your costs are starting to go up significantly. It would also include data collection. The, this would give time to figure out whether or not the sources are truly from the non-point sources, or if it's from non-point sources that are that can be controlled or if it's non-point sources that cannot be controlled. And there would be time to reach out to the other stakeholders. As Jake said, there, you know, a lot of the, the non-point source reductions will be on a voluntary basis. Colorado does not have the legal ability to go out and tell farmers or whoever, wherever these sources are from that you have to meet an MPDES standard like the dual point source. 
the the Reg 31 for now will be applied, those numbers will be applied above those municipalities and areas that are is very clean. That number for the 10 years of the control reg will not be put into place. Re lakes and reservoirs will be protected, as, especially if they're a water supply at the ultra low levels. and. It, this will give time for Reg 85 to come into place for those dischargers and start work, you know, working in some implementation of nutrient reductions that may offset some of the issues with, with non-point source. Control Reg numbers, the in, division's intent was enhanced, was BNR for all facilities. Numbers that were put out are the next level of treatment and are currently being negotiated difference between these numbers and BNR numbers for the city of Hubble is about $20 million. So it, there's a lot of money on the table when you talk about nutrients and, and what the cost of those impacts may be. A BNR uh, level of treatment can reduce as much as 80% of the phosphorus and as a side benefit will take out a lot of the nitrogen as well. But as you can, it, you can see if you Look at the BNR, which is about a one to two milligram per liter level of treatment. There's there is still some cost, but if you think about what the phosphorus was on that first table for Reg 81, which was at about a 0.1, if you go over to the 0.1 and you go up from that, you can see it's an exponential increase in cost. So it's great to say I want to have ultra pure water out there, but you got to have your pocketbook open and ready to handle the, the cost that it's going to take to get that level of cleanup. And at the same time, you're going to find the farmer downstream, he's testing his water and seeing how many nutrients are in the water and everything we took out, he now is going to have to add back to his, his field because he's not going to have the nutrients from the water source. So there's got to be, like I was saying, a balance in here. Nitrogen's even even more. If you look at the, at the up to about two, one and a half, two, it's fairly reasonable to treat nitrogen. Beyond that, it's extremely exponential. What might happen after these improvements are done? We may find, uh, with all the river sampling, We've done nothing. It's, pot it's potential that in, in some river segments, it's not the discharger. It's, it is actually from the non-point sources. And it's very likely that there's going to be a number of areas that that BNR treatment will have made no improvement. But that data collection has to be done. And it has to be modeled and looked at and determined what the appropriate standards are before we go into the next phase at the end of the of the uh, control rate, which is 10 years. It's possible that non-point sources can be addressed and then other, other ways can be found to address those through not only voluntary but through funding. Farm Bill at the federal level right now is looking at putting in a significant amount of money for funding monitoring in, in agricultural Concepts, so that could could provide some avenues that would put additional funds there for for correcting the nutrient issues. <coughs> small facilities, there are some some exemptions for the very small, and depending on their type of treatment, the cost to convert to a BNR type of treatment is going to be thousands of dollars per person. It's very expensive, especially if you have a small base. The control reg will start being implemented as soon as the per, as soon as the hearing is over. When your permit comes up for renewal, then you will have a compliance schedule put in your permit to meet the BNR numbers. It, that that compliance schedule can include things that would look at at funding to look at at ways that you're going to meet those numbers at. Um, developing cost that if you have an area that is has a, a reduced amount of um, median income 
then those can come into the to the evaluation at that point. The data collection is going to be crucial because it's up to every facility to make that determination as to whether your facility can meet that compliance schedule to put in treatment and start treating to the BNR level or do you need to have data to show that 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 treatment may not be appropriate or you may have economic feasibility difficulties or to justify a variance for your facility or to justify a longer period of time for compliance. Each facility must make those determinations right up front. Um, variances are, are going to be available. They're not going to be cheap to get and they're not going to be easy to get. The variance must show that the nutrient reduction benefits do not bear a reasonable relationship to the economic, environmental, or energy impacts. It's going to take some, some significant amount of studies to be able to show that. Monitoring is a huge issue. It, in, in the control reg, there will be requirements for every facility to do total phosphorus, total nitrogen, and flow of their uh, uh, monitoring of their plant and upstream and downstream of their plant. It is not sufficient. With that, that amount of data, you're going to be very, very lacking in, in the ability to develop those site-specific standards and the, and the um, um, variances that you're going to need for your facility if you cannot comply with those numbers. Stormwater is going to need a significant amount of monitoring for dry weather and wet weather monitoring. Re nutrient reductions are, have got to come from a lot of sources. And this is from the USGS Sparrow model. And if you look at the blue portions on these maps, these, these are the non-agricultural urban forestry um, sources. If you look at the uh, livestock <coughs> waste, that's the orange portions. If you look at the green is the fertilizer portion. And what the portion you see that's purple, does anybody see purple on there? <laughs> South Platte has some, <coughs> Arkansas Basin has some, and there's a very small amount in the other basins. Even, oops, even more so for nitrogen. Many of the basins do not have anything on the pie chart showing for point sources. The, the sources are non-point for many of these. There may be a stream segment that will have a problem, but they're overall for the whole basin, the amount of nitrogen that is coming from point sources, small amount in the Arkansas, fairly large amount in the Arkansas and the South Platte, beyond that is non-point sources. We can clean everything up in a point sport source, <coughs> spend millions of dollars of doing it, and potentially do nothing in the river. Non-point sources are going to require a lot more work. Cost-benefit study will help to show the impact of this. Now, there's, there's a number of unresolved issues, which I'm not going to get into, that, that are yet to be, be settled. You know, there's a lot of ongoing work with the division and with the, the uh, watershed, I mean, the work groups, and hopefully some of these issues can be resolved. The biggest, biggest thing that I would like to emphasize is the need for monitoring. You know, and everybody sitting in this room needs to be involved in the monitoring piece. A watershed group needs to be developed. There's a lot of a lot of issues in the Arkansas Basin that are nutrient related, and each person in this room has a piece of that pie that could be added to it. And, and monitoring through a through a watershed organization will show a lot more and be, have a lot more value and we can resolve these issues in the Arkansas Basin with data <coughs> rather than a few municipalities doing some monitoring that's required that really is not going to show anything other than whether or not we're in compliance with the standard. Mm -hmm.